Hey everyone, welcome back to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. My name is Sam Thrash, and I am your show host over here at Fall Obsession. This week, we are getting the Flatland Deer Country crew back together. Myself, our Western staff coordinator, Tim Burgess, and one of our show producers, Mike Teepe. We all uh, reconvene to finish the story, if you will. If you guys have been listening to recent episodes specifically podcast 166 and 167 uh, you will have heard the story from our flatland uh, deer country saga and adventure that we had out there in eastern colorado um, i was super privileged to be able to kill uh, my very first mule deer buck spot and stalk with a bow on top of that in the flat farmland of eastern colorado that's the story that's told in episode 166 and then we busted our butts and worked really hard to try and get Mike on a whitetail in the same environment in the same country and uh, had a bunch of challenges that came with that. And that's the story 167. We recorded those two podcast episodes in Colorado in deer camp um, as the hunt was going on. And the first episode 166 is it covers days one through three. And then 167 covers days four through six. But there was a seventh day after that last podcast um, that left that story unfinished. And a big part of that story was the grand finale, Tim being able to put down a monster muley uh, on opening day of rifle season. So I got the group back together so that we can uh, finish that story and uh, complete the, uh, the adventure for you guys. So... Hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Unlike the other ones, it is not in person. This one is a a virtual podcast. I love the in-person ones better, but it was still good to get on here and hang out with the guys again and uh, get to reminisce a little bit over an awesome, awesome hunting trip and an awesome week that we all got to spend together. So on top of that, I'll also plug real quick that we have the video for this hunt released at this point in time on our YouTube channel. It is titled Flatland Deer Country, a fall obsession film. It's about a little over a half hour long, so one of our longer productions, but it uh, it is a, a complete story of everything that happened out there, um, as much as we were able to tell it given the footage and the, the pieces that we have. So if you guys, it's one of our... In my opinion, my humble opinion, it's it's one of our, our better productions from a standpoint of, of filming to uh, the end game at the end. Sure, there's always stuff that we could have done better or differently from a production standpoint. You live and learn with these things, especially when you're self-filming or filming for your buddies. But um, it, it's an awesome story. It came together in an awesome video. And if you guys haven't watched Flatland Deer Country yet on YouTube, uh, please go do so. So before we get to the episode, though, I got to plug the partners and the folks that work with us here at Fall Obsession to help make our podcast possible and to make sure that you guys get a new episode every single week. The first one is Hoot Camo, and if you are watching this podcast video on YouTube, you will notice that I am wearing a Hoot Camo t-shirt right here. This is their Buho pattern. Hoot is made uh, down here in Texas. They are a Texas-based company. They design their own gear. They design their own patterns. But don't let it fool you. They're not trying to stick to Texas. They are applicable everywhere, if you will. Um, they they make products that work in a multi- multitude of environments. Um, I have worn this exact pattern I'm wearing right now in Texas this year, in Colorado, on this uh, flatland deer hunt that I keep talking about. Um, and the gear held up absolutely outstanding so and we actually mike and i during this podcast actually talk about it briefly about uh, the quality of gear that hoot makes so if you are a blue collar hunter and you are wanting to get into a new set of high quality camouflage you need to check out hoot camo they are dedicated to making gear that is on par with the industry leaders as far as quality but is at a price point that the blue collar guys like you and me can afford and if you go to their website and check out their prices you will quickly realize that they are very affordable for somebody wanting to get into again a good quality set of camouflage so head on over to their website hootcamo.com and if you want to place an order the code fallobsession15 will give you guys uh, a discount at checkout 
checkout. So go check out Hoot Camo today. Our next partner for the podcast is Ridge Rock Hunt Company, Derek and Lacey over there in Mississippi. They book hunts with vetted outfitters across the country. So if you're looking to book that next adventure, that next hunting trip, um, and you want to go somewhere different, try something new, maybe check one off the bucket list, give Derek a call. He'll work with you on all the details, timeline, licensing, pricing, location, what you're going to hunt, all that good stuff. And he will set you up with something that he himself um, will be willing to hunt with or a trip that he'd be willing to go on himself. So Derek Eves at Ridge Rock, he's the man. Go give him a call and check out Ridge Rock Hunt Company on Facebook and their social media. And check out Ridge Rock Hunt. Oh my gosh! And check out Ridge Rock Hunt Company on Facebook and their website. Our other partner is the Outdoor Call Radio app. Outdoors Dan from Respect the Game TV. He has created an app for hunters and outdoorsmen that you can download on any device, where you can stream hunting shows and podcasts on a loop every single day. You will catch Fall Obsession podcast on that loop. Uh, Every Monday, the same day as our new publications, as well as tons of other hunting shows and podcasts that you all know and love. So go download the Outdoor Call Radio app today and start streaming. And go follow Outdoors Dan on uh, social media as well. He does a couple of different live broadcasts, live radio shows, at different points during the week in local Midwest radio stations. But if you're not local to one of those stations, you can catch his live broadcasts on Wednesdays and Saturdays on his Facebook Live as well. So... The Outdoor Call Radio app and Outdoors Dan, go check them out. Last thing I'm going to say is if you guys are interested in partnering with Fall Obsession and maybe advertising your own hunting or outdoor brand in this sponsor segment on our podcast, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk to you. Go to fallobsession.com slash podcast. That's where you guys can find a form that will put you in touch with myself and our production team, and we can talk the details, we can talk numbers, and what you guys can expect to see advertising through our show on both your normal everyday streaming apps and what we're getting right now from Carbon TV. So if you're interested in working with us, fallobsession.com slash podcast is where you need to go. That's all from me in this sponsor segment. We're going to head over to the episode now. I hope you guys enjoy this conversation I have with Tim and Mike. Um, I will also preface it and just let you guys know we do have uh, a couple of segments during the episode, some brief moments where you might hear uh, some children in the background. Uh, we're, we're hunters, we're show producers, we have our podcast, but we're also uh, husbands and fathers as well. So every once in a while, you might hear a kid in the background. Sorry about that, but those are the lives we live. Needless to say, hope you guys enjoy. You are listening to another Fall Obsession podcast. Oh, you got her, dude. She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Freaking smoked him. One with nature, and if you're a believer, one with God. Definitely gets your heart pumping. Boy, you are in trouble. Obsession Podcast. The Flatland crew is back together for another Fall Obsession Podcast episode. What's happening, everybody? I'm Sam, your show host. Joining me is our Fall Obsession Western Staff Coordinator, Tim Burgess. Welcome back, Tim. Yep, good to be back. And one of our show producers out there in Michigan, uh, producer of our Midwest Mindset Series on Carbon TV, Mike Teepee, back on the podcast. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me again. Absolutely. So a little bit different setting than the last time we recorded some podcasts together. Uh, and I, I'll have to say I thoroughly enjoy the in-person podcast a lot better than these virtual ones, but we're making the most out of it. And the reason we're hopping back on here is because our last, it wasn't the last two episodes, it was a, a few weeks ago now, episodes 66 and 67, titled Flatland Mule Deer and then followed by Flatland Whitetail recapped our our hunting trip we all got to experience together up there in Colorado at the invitation of Tim and and your family um but when we record the second one the hunting wasn't done yet we still had uh one day to follow that in the trip and I only got to experience half of that day the uneventful half of course is how it would work out but uh Want to get back on here with you guys so that we can talk about the third and final 
piece of this story, if you will, the the grand finale, if you will, um, revolving around Tim and a buck that you were able to put on the ground, Tim, that uh, seventh evening of the hunt. But um, we can, I want to talk about that and then obviously reflect the trip a little bit with you guys here and uh, yeah, just kind of reminisce on what was an incredible hunt. So, but Tim, I'm going to turn it over to you a little bit and just, if you want to give our listeners a, a quick backstory real quick on day seven and uh, what you were looking at as far as muleys out there that you had your eye on for opening day arrival. Yeah. So we, uh, day six, uh, if you guys will all probably remember if you've heard any of our stuff is the day we had the poacher craziness. Um, and so we are pretty much committed to first light and a little beyond trying to find that white tail for Mike. And then, um, I've been like, I had enough, we saw enough bucks that I really wasn't that worried about finding a mule deer. It was more kind of like finding the right one than it was finding a buck. So, um, I committed the first hour ish of like legal light to helping you guys with that. And then, um, checked a bunch of spots, on the way from that spot back to the house where I knew a couple were bigger bucks were located uh, by the farmhouse. So yeah, we kind of just split up at that point. I checked the spots where we had seen a few on the way back, didn't find them. And then, uh, the buck we keep seeing at cup, the, the forky and that bigger buck we kept seeing at the feedlot. Um, I bumped them just South where Sam shot his buck on that South CRP actually. Um, and uh, got kind of got in front of them and then had to relocate them a couple times. And you guys had called you at that point. You had kind of given up on finding that whitetail um, to make a plan to go make a stock, like not really a stock, but kind of just relocate them again, um, try to push them out of the trees they were in and, and see where they went. And uh, everything went really well with that, except for the big buck just kind of vanished. Uh, yeah, we bumped deer, but we didn't bump the one you were looking for. Yeah, we bumped the forky. We bumped the, like seven or nine or whatever does it was with them. Um, they all kind of split in different directions. So, but it was, every deer was accounted for except for him. So he either laid down in that CRP and said screw it, or he snuck out sooner, which I'm guessing he's probably he probably didn't stop when the rest of them did. I'm guessing he just kept winning, which is fine. Um, that was like ten ish, ten thirty, wasn't it? at that point yeah it it was it was somewhere in there i think because we were we were still giving it uh, we were kind of throwing everything we had at him at that point i feel like after all that went down and everything and i think mike when uh because we were trying to split up a little bit and just cover more ground and again try to locate that buck and i know you and i went tim we went one way uh in one truck and sent mike the opposite way in the other truck and Mike, if I remember right, you almost had a deer run underneath your tire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that little forked buck, he he come just shooting out of those uh, cedars. And I literally had to slam on the brakes uh, on the truck there because I dang near took him out. I mean, he, yeah, it was, that was so unexpected. I had no idea that he would just dart out of there. And not only that, but dart out on my side of the cedars. I was hoping he'd dart out on your guys' side. Um, but, yeah, that 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 was definitely <laughs> – that was intense there for, for a couple seconds. <laughs> Not what you expect. No. So we're trying to relocate this buck for you, Tim, but I don't know. It's kind of dwindling down. I know we I know we threw everything we had, like I said, at, you know, kind of those last, last couple hours when you all had me as far as – because I had to leave around – I think I set kind of noonish. With like my, a noon cut. noon Yeah, hard noon cut. And, yeah. like, at that point, I was like, well, we'll go walk these two other spots where he probably went. And, of course, he didn't go to either of them. We scared one doe out of the two of them. And so at that point, I was like, well, uh, let's get you packed up and on the road. And then went back to the house, got you packed up and gone. Uh, Mike, you went out back hunting pretty quick, if mm-hmm. I remember right. Like maybe even before yeah. Sam left, if I. I yeah, I think I went back out right around the time that Sam. Well, I said goodbye, and he was finishing packing the truck. Yeah. So before yeah. before we get into Tim, like leading into the afternoon, though, uh, I, I want to I want to turn it over to you too, Mike, because we. Uh, we left off and 
if people listen to 66 and 67, they know that obviously as Tim already mentioned, there's the issue with the poacher that we were dealing with on day six. And then if you watch the flatland video, um, the whole hunt video that we just put out, you know, you, you see a, a segment toward the end of you giving some commentary at the beginning of day seven, talking about just some pressure that we felt like we were under because we knew we weren't hunting that whitetail alone. So talk about kind of in the other truck. Cause we, you know, Tim was trying to help us just being another set of eyes in another area for that whitetail, but then he peeled off eventually to hunt muleys. What was it like on the whitetail grind morning number seven? Oh, it was super, super stressful. Uh, the pressure was, was immense. Um, we, uh, like I said in the video, against my better judgment, Tim elected to help us there for that first hour of daylight. Um, you know, I ended up working out just fine for Tim. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I felt like maybe Tim should go after some of those nice mule deer he had located. Um, but... I, I appreciate it greatly that he was willing to give up that first hour of daylight to help me try and locate that stud whitetail. Um, it, it became apparent very quickly. Um, Sam, you rode with me, and we went, and uh, like we said, we split up with Tim, and we tried to relocate that joker between where he was at the night before when we left him at dark and where we – bumped him because we all felt pretty confident he was going to probably head back home just wasn't sure if he was going to make it back in daylight or not yeah and we just don't i don't know i none of us really know we i i don't know how many hours i put looking through the binoculars looking for that deer on on that seventh and final day but could not find him and uh like i said right after first light it became apparent that we were not the only ones hunting this deer. Uh, we felt pretty confident that that white truck would be back in there hunting him. Sure enough, he was there hunting him. And then there was a black truck that seemed, kind of seemed like he was running with the white truck. And then he was looking for it too. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of speculating at that, but well, uh, it, just a little bit kept, you know, we kept seeing those two together. Yeah, and, and that was the thing. We we saw the white truck pretty early, the the suspected, or, or I mean, we know he was a poacher from the day before. Um, yeah. And we saw him pretty quick. We noticed the black pickup, and at first we didn't really think anything of it just because it's opening day rifle. <laughs> and, Tim, you had t kind of told us, hey, at, at some point we're going to see other people out here. It, it's going to happen, you know. And then we, uh, from there we began noticing it became apparent that we didn't think the white truck um got spotlighted that buck that night or that he had had any early morning success because it, he was kind of driving like he was scrambling too, you know trying to mm -hmm. locate something but to your point it began as the morning progressed and we saw him here and there and everywhere wherever he was that black truck was always within a mile of him and that that yeah. it, it was very uh, suspicious, I guess you could say. He might have had a buddy helping him. So, yeah, yeah, we put a lot of effort in trying to locate that deer that day. Um, like when you left to go back home, that's what I, I went and just started. I, I left probably two three hours before ten, um, and I just started walking all the CRP patches that I could, and so. That's what uh, I did for the majority of the beginning of that day and throughout the day was just go after that deer as hard as I could. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it, it was no joke. Just, I mean, it was the same grind, but the, the day six grind, we've already talked about how it, it felt different. It didn't feel like normal hunting because of everything we were dealing with with the poacher. I don't know. Day seven, at least the part I was a part of, it was just... I don't know. There's just, there was that added stress, and I don't know. I don't know if I've ever even felt that before. And I, again, I wasn't the one hunting, but it it just it felt like we were just rushed, and it it wasn't a good feeling, you know. N nobody wants to feel like that when you're trying to be out there deer hunting or anything like that. So. Yeah. No, I agree. It was definitely not a good feeling at all. Um, we. I felt like if we didn't find that deer in the first 30 minutes of daylight, we, we probably weren't going to find him. Yeah. It was either somebody else was going to shoot him or he was long gone. And, 
you know, who knows what happened with that big joker. All I know is I hope he's still alive for, you know, for us maybe to have a chance at in the future, you know. Yeah. No, that, we, we have no reason to believe that, at least while we were out there hunting, that that anybody else took him. But obviously it's a lot of ground. There's no telling what, what could have happened. So, but hope for the best, I guess. Well, I want to... At this point, I'm leaving. I'm out of the picture. I'm driving back to Texas. So it's just you two guys out there. So y'all take us into uh, what the afternoon and leading into the to the evening held. Um, because as we alluded to in the beginning, Tim uh, Tim was able to put the grand finale and the and the fireworks show on <laughs> there at the very end of this trip. So yeah, you can go ahead, Mike. Yeah. So like I said, right when you were leaving. Uh, um, Sam this is when I, I left and I, I was feeling the pressure and so I left two three hours before Tim did for the evening hunt and I was just putting boots on the ground trying to see if I could flush that big buck out of some potential CRP that was in that area um, ended up uh, falling short on that didn't end up seeing honestly didn't end up seeing anything while I was doing that um, fast forward it was about 3 p.m. got dark Oh, what was it getting dark? Like four thirty, five o'clock, something like that. Yeah, yeah I was just thought now it was like the four, four thirty, four twenties, four thirties, and then yeah, so dark. Legal right. light was I think like five ish. Yeah, yeah, legal light was like right around five, I think. But you and I met up, um, not far from where we had located that big buck, about three o'clock, I would say, and we were trying to come up with a game plan for both of us. Um, ran into, well, actually didn't run into, we were just standing there chatting, looking at our phones, coming up with ideas, bouncing ideas off each other, and that's when the local game warden stopped in to uh, chat chat it up with us a little bit there. And, and you you had some experience with this guy in the past, correct? Yeah, it's, he's been our game warden for four or five years now. Uh, he's one of the better ones we've had, at least the last – out of the last two or three they've been he's probably the best of them um so yeah we talked to him a bit told him what happened the day before because i had texted him and called him and annoyed him so kind of filled him in he checked us you know did the whole check the license have a great day got got done with that uh, and then we we split up again and you kind of just yeah <laughs> drove around and i kind of just drove around him yeah yeah, I kind of went in desperation once again, looking for that deer. Yeah, and the range that you're covering too is just it. It's broad because, and again, I know we've talked about this previously, but Tim would be educating us through the whole week on how these deer act, how far these deer can travel. You know, and mm -hmm. I I don't like. Yeah, we say yeah, okay, but I don't think we truly understood until day six when we watched three bucks travel five miles in one day um with plenty of plenty of time standing still plenty of time bedding plenty of time you know hanging out doing whatever they wanted so to i bring that up to say that that whole five mile range from where we saw them the night before to where they called home and anywhere else around there was in play that was that was huntable ground as far as you know the area they could be in so you had it was a needle in a haystack pursuit for you no doubt yeah yeah it was and that's that's why i just i told tim i said hey i'm gonna i'm just gonna you know that was the only whitetails we had located uh it wasn't like we had another pocket you know 20 miles away five miles away in a different direction that i could go try and make a play on so i felt like all my eggs were in that basket yeah. um so I told Tim, I said, well, I'm just going to have to just keep going around and around and around here where, uh, you know, we've seen them come and go over the last two days, three days. And then Tim started heading for where he had had some encounters with some mule deer. And then Tim gives me a call, uh, fast forward through the night, and I get a call from Tim about 25 to 30 minutes before quitting time. And why don't you uh, start us off there, Tim, with how that went? Yeah, so I we broke we I ditched you around three fifteen, three thirty, whatever it was, and then um, 
headed back more towards the house, farmhouse just because it's usually I know the area better. So I was like, I'm going to go where I know. And we saw that one guy this morning. So I was like, well, we'll go there. And the um, other ones I hadn't found were the spots I was going to check where the other two we had, big ones we had seen uh, were on the way. So I checked all those, got back, didn't find anything, and then just drove around a while, make a turn to go south on a road. And then there's a, a ch- bunch of like mostly dead trees right up against the road, like single file trees, um, like, uh, like I don't know what they are, but not like evergreens, but like a, some kind of oak or something. Uh, but yeah, mostly dead. And so then like this tree road just explodes. I mean, like I count. So I'm like, okay, there's a bunch of deer. So I pull off and get off and it's a spot I can hunt. So I get out of the truck, like just get off legally off the road, get the rifle, get the two sticks up, take my time. And deer are just running and I'm counting, counting, counting. I get the 52 deer oh my in gosh. this whole stretch. Uh, and there might've been more than that. Cause I, think i missed a couple but it was at least in the you know at least 52 but uh so first buck runs by and they kind of do this thing where they run from the southwest to the northeast and then they're kind of like looping back around farther away um and so like i range where they're like looping back and it's like 340 and they and i like was looking at that trying to get on this one buck that was up there um which we ended up seeing him later that night um and he was i thought he was bigger than the one i shot but he was actually smaller so it kind of worked out in the end but uh so i was trying to get on him farther away and uh you know just really looking it out and then this other guy jumps up and it looks like they're right next to each other so i just put the put my reticle right on him and squeeze off and i'm shooting like i'm at 340 when really he was at like 180 170 so i hit him dead in the spine just drop him right there um and all the other deer kind of just like hang around him and like don't move a whole lot so i reload then i rearrange him and i'm like oh that's the problem and so his back legs are totally out of commission his front legs are not uh, are sort of working at this point but not really he's like trying to get up but he he doesn't have any anything in the back to to stand on so it's just kind of not going so hot so i call you real quick and i'm like hey this is where i'm at come come give me a hand i'm gonna need it as soon as i get the get him shot again so i take some time he's kind of turned straight away from me at this point and he's trying to like hop up so he's slowly making the the quarter turn i need him to make to be broadside as soon as he does he does a bump lays down put it right through the bre- right through the double lung uh drop him perfectly on the second shot lights out like in 10 seconds he just rolls over and done donezo so get the truck drive out there and waiting for mike and then all the deer kind of just like filter to this next field and so we're just i'm just waiting and then you pull up we get them loaded and get rolling and it's like pretty close to last light or might even be last light at this point like so we're just like let's get home you know at this point we're like let's just get home and we, we want to get another processor before they close so i'd called my grandma while i was waiting for you and had her call a processor let them know we're going to be on our way so we didn't get a whole lot of pictures or anything because it was kind of like let's yeah. get this done and it was you know so we back to the house took like four pictures five pictures grabbed my grandparents got in the truck ran to the processor got him uh, ended up getting them caped out and everything by them because they do all that they're awesome processor where they don't even want them gutted they just they'll take them whole and so we, i didn't even gut him nothing just put the tag on him dropped him off got him we got him out of the truck dragged him out of the door the guys took over from there and you know we we double checked the cape got done right and then got out of there and then uh we got back to the house and got mike on the road and then i i ended up staying until about lunch time or a little after Saturday to, to finish up some projects and clean up some stuff we left out. And I want to stop you for a second, Tim. And what, what did, what happened on the way home from the processor? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. We're uh, just, we're on the state line because the process is Nebraska. We're had just got into the back onto the state line from Nebraska and a white, one white tail doe almost takes our truck out, like runs. <laughs> and then, like, there's at least two more on one side of the road and at least one more on the other side. We're like, what the heck is this? <laughs> like, how far? I mean, this was 
this wasn't necessarily the area that we were focusing a lot of time on, you know, because this was south of the farmhouse. But mm -hmm. this, this was how close to where, I mean, this was right in the hub where we'd been hunting. Yeah, it would have been like three mile, uh, about between two and three miles south of the house and just a little bit east. And like we would have, it was the section south of like where we had our draw that we hunted like crazy for them because they're usually there. So yeah, it was, it's like we we have been driv driving the road on the north side of this, like where they were, and like maybe a quarter mile from where they were, uh, probably ten times every day or more. God, so it wasn't okay. like we hadn't looked here. It's Dude, just... I was so frustrated because I'm like, are you serious? So there was another pocket of white tail. We just hadn't located them. <laughs> they... Yeah, I almost wonder if they were crossing back over from Nebraska and they'd been in Nebraska the whole time. So they knew when the well, hunt was over. Them, they were coming off of Colorado, going to Nebraska. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They knew when it was over. <laughs> Dude, it was like, that was so frustrating. And I and don't get me wrong, all we saw was does. But dude, if you got a that time of year, if you got a pocket of, I think I counted five does, if I remember right. If yeah, you got a pocket of five does, there's probably a pretty good chance you got a buck with them. Or you're gonna have one soon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. we, we could have just kept eyes on them if we would have been able to locate these this little doe family group and just kept eyes on them, and waited for something to move in potentially while we were there. Yeah. It's it's funny y'all bring that up cuz uh, uh, granted the the trip and everything things unfolded the way they were meant to be as far as you know when when my deer came into play Tim they, you didn't even mention Tim that this this is also the mule deer you kill is also your the best mule you've ever shot. So that's also to be deter yeah it's uh, i think it's gonna be close I, mean, yeah. I know you guys keep saying it's not i think it's gonna be close i think i think you will maybe edge him out um he has he's four by four with one brow tied um he doesn't have a ton of mass but he's pretty he's definitely my widest one that's for sure he's super wide. um he's super wide so that's why i think he's gonna be in the conversation um, my other one has pretty good mass. My other big one has pretty good mass and he's a five by four with both with double brow types that are both with two brow types that are both pretty good size. So I think it's going to be close than you guys think it do. I, I, I don't think he beats it by much, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah. It's yeah, my mom is on him being bigger. I, I would, I would second that for sure, but we'll to be determined as well. We'll have to, you'll have to let us know when you finally get a chance to tape them out. But I think it's funny though, cause obviously, like I mentioned, everything was meant to, meant to be the way it was, but we started the whole trip as, as we mentioned in previous episodes with snow on the ground and just struggling to see deer period at all out there. And I, you can't help but wonder, you take that weather event, that winter weather event that we started the trip with, and you push it forward a week. You get, you make that happen a week before we hunted. What kind of difference would we have seen? Because again, day one through three, I, I think we mentioned in the video, my, the buck I killed was like my third or fourth deer to even lay eyes on me personally, you know, that yeah. trip is your fourth. Yeah. Your fourth, my fourth deer to lay eyes on in three days. But last day when you killed yours, you're talking about flushing a pocket of 50 of them, you know, and that's, yeah, and that's I, the contrast I, that that weather, you know, brought with it. So, yeah. And I had seen probably just Friday, I probably saw 110. Yeah, I believe so it. So I'd see a pocket of seven, a pocket of five, maybe not quite. Yeah, pro probably about 110 pockets yeah. here and there, and mostly all does. And then like that, you know, like that first pocket had two bucks, or one of the other pockets had two bucks. But, but yeah, just lots of pockets of does all over the place. Well, I mean, honestly, from day four through day seven, we saw we saw exceptional numbers of mule deer. Even when we weren't even looking for mule deer and we were looking for whitetail, we we saw quite a few deer those last three to four days. Yeah. So, it, like you said, the weather just completely screwed the first two days. I mean, the first two days were a complete wash. Yeah. And even day three was very, I mean, yeah, it was very eventful, but yet not from necessarily seeing lots of deer mm -hmm. um but eventful in the fact that you were able to kill a deer i mean it only takes one you just need right. the right one um 
But yeah, it was crazy as the week went on. Like you said, we got warmer temperatures, the snow started to melt. And like every day, it just seemed like to increase, boom, more deer, more deer, more deer, more deer, all the way up until, you know, when we left. And like you said, it's hard saying if we would have stuck around one, two, three more days or, you know, if the weather would have shifted different, like you said, who knows? Um, man, it might have been totally, I'm, I mean, you know, still to have a great hunt like we did, but it might have been um, just an entirely different feel to the hunt. Yeah, I think the weather was super helpful for Sam, though, because it definitely kept them holding longer and staying still and everything. Whereas I don't know, like, if it had been just, like, been in the 60s, like it can be in December out there, I don't know if that guy would have hung out for that long in that spot when Sam stocked in. I'm pretty sure he would have been moving much sooner than, two, you know, the two hours it took. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no telling on that. It just... I, 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 the biggest thing that I think made that stock possible was the wind and, and I like, yeah. doesn't matter what kind of weather or temps you have or anything like that for that, you know, to possibly hold that deer there longer. I, if we hadn't had the wind that we had and hadn't have played the wind the right way, I would have never gotten a shot at that buck. That wind covered, covered my noise. It covered my movement. Uh, you know, or, I mean, I'm already trying to minimize both, you know, as much as possible, obviously, but what little there was, the wind covered it and, uh, obviously kept my scent from getting anywhere close to them until we were right in there. So, I mean, if y'all, if, if y'all have heard the stories as listeners or anything, you know, that it, I, I tried to get him to stand the first time and he, he didn't even stand up. He, I, I don't know if yeah. he didn't hear me because of the wind or what, but he didn't even stand up the first time I tried. So. No, those first three days were brutal from the wind. I mean, brutally cold yeah. and windy. And that's coming from a guy here in in the Midwest where, you know, I was out hunting tonight and it was 32 degrees out. But that was comfortable compared to what we had going on out there with the temps and the wind and how wide open that wind just gets howling out there. But, yeah, like day three. Day one through three was super windy, but if you remember day four, five, six, seven, the wind really died off. Uh, we've seen a lot more deer too, but the stalking conditions were definitely not like when I was trying to make those stalks in there on that whitetail buck, the conditions were nowhere near as good. A lot of that snow was starting to melt and then had frosted again. So it was super loud, super crunchy, uh, didn't have the strong winds to cover up the noise like we had the previous days. So, yeah, it was definitely meant to be uh, with your deer, for sure. Oh, yeah, I, I 100% agree with that. And, yeah, I couldn't I, – I can't say enough about it. Or I, I know y'all too, Tim, for the for the invite that I finally accepted <laughs> coming out there. And then you guys, uh, you know, toughing it out in the truck, holding your binos up for two hours, just watching this <laughs> Texas boy try to call, crawl through the Colorado weeds. <laughs> appreciate it yeah i'm gonna have to do some more shoulder presses this year to be ready for that again (laughs) yeah Yeah, i remember i'm definitely gonna be investing in some better binos yeah that uh i mean y'all were already poking fun at me and my texas size bow hunting binoculars down here and i got made fun of the a couple weekends later on the veteran hunt (laughs) for them as well (laughs) but uh yeah that's that's gonna be an investment coming up soon where i i need some I need some better, better optics. So, yeah, I mean, when, when you're ready, let me know and I'll tell you what to you give me your budget. I'll tell you what to get. Cause <laughs> I, I mean, I sold them for about six months at Cabela's. Like I know, I know them well. So when you're ready, just shoot me a text. Fair enough. <laughs> other than that, what other gear do you feel like you needed that you didn't have or other oh, or <laughs> y'all know the answer to this <laughs> i haven't heard any new boot sponsors of you <laughs> no not but yet the y'all giving me a hard time about the boots is going to be in the pheasant video that's when the majority of that footage was uh was shot so maybe after we drop some pheasant hunting footage uh here next week or so maybe maybe we'll draw some people in but yeah the the footwear the boots are are the first thing that i probably need better gear of man and like they weren't they're not bad 
and the boots are not old the you know the soles were just starting to wear off a little bit like on the heels kind of uh -huh. in the back and i i didn't want them to get to the point where i'm walking and they're just you know flapping against my feet which is why i put the tape on there because I knew they were getting bad, and it wasn't until I got up there, I was like, because I noticed it down in Texas, I was like, oh, I need to fix these before I go to Colorado, and I forgot about it until I got up there. I was like, well, I got duct tape. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and I mean, it, so, it lasted. Yeah, hey, do you super glue them yet? Yeah, they, they've, been, uh, they've been fixed the correct way and are back in commission now down here, so haven't haven't broken on me again i haven't had to break the duct tape back out but at the same time i haven't been walking like i was walking up there either so but that would that would be the first thing i would say would be obviously the boots i have to say that right i gotta say that the boots were the first yeah. thing but um man the hoot gear i think it did a really good job as far as i mean granted i had i wore I wasn't, I wasn't trying to like push my limits with the gear in that. I wasn't like, oh, let's see, you know, just wearing this. Let's see how cold I get. No, I wasn't about to play that game. So I had on a good base layer. I had on, you know, my fleece, hoot fleece underneath it. And then my, my you know, uh, heavyweight hoot gear on top of that. And that kept me really warm. Uh, just my face, my feet, and my hands, as far as gear on my person, that, uh, that would have been the, the ticket for sure. Um, having, I, I don't know, I need to do some better research probably on gloves. Uh, if I'm going to do something like that again, I mean, m my gloves did okay, but at the same time we were in and out of the truck enough. I don't think I wouldn't, I never sat other than my two hour stock. I was never out in the elements. I know Mike, you had a couple of sits yourself where you were sitting out there still for a long time. So I don't, you might have some better insight on stuff like that, but, um, yeah, I could, I could use some better gloves if I went back and did it again. Yeah, I would say optics for me, like not just um, not just the um, binoculars, but rangefinder. Uh, yeah. I'd like to even improve that too. I know I was getting frustrated. I was texting you guys on that second stalk through the wheat stubble. Um, I, I couldn't get any ranges in, in that wheat stubble, and maybe every rangefinder will be like that. But I know mine's a little cheaper quality, I'm wondering if I got a better quality one, if I could have had some better ideas how close I was getting towards those deer uh, because I was getting really frustrated not having, you know, actual yardages to know where I was at. Yeah. Tim, you hunt out there all the time. Uh, what what range finder do you think is is works for that or are, are we overthinking it, thinking we got to get a good quality one? Because I know when excuse me i know when you're talking about you know trying to range stuff like mike just pointed out in grass or in wheat you know obviously those those finer obstructions like that can can mess with your range finder what have you found to work best in your experience so mine i have it used to be really good but now it's just old i have a, a loophole tbr 1000 so it's like it was their top of the line like 10 years ago but now it's like i mean now it'd be like a hundred bucks used if that um if you could find a new one it might be a hundred bucks like they're i mean they're okay it's not it doesn't it doesn't do the job good enough my brother has a really nice like uh one i forget if he has the 28 or the 3200 um the rdf they're they're little they're little one not their binoculars um that thing is incredible um if you were gonna upgrade like in my opinion makes the best range finders people may not agree with me but definitely standalone range finders they make the best range finding binos i think theirs are the best um i have swirl binos swarovski binos for me um without a range finder in them um that are super awesome so like i think if any either swarovski zeiss or like if you're gonna go with one of those um for binos would be great range finders i would stick i would go if you can jump into leica that's the way to go um if not loophole is a little bit cheaper it's still like 400 ish probably for their new top of the line one um but if you're once you buy it like like i said mine's about 10 years old and it was probably outdated after six years um uh, to give you an idea like i'm getting ranges 
on like deer and animals to about 550, 500, depending on conditions. Um, like good reflective rocks and stuff. I might get like 650, 700, um, but I'm not getting anything close to the thousand. It claims that you can't even like cars sitting out there. Like I might get 800 on a car. That's like obviously the most reflective service you're ever going to see in the world. So, um, definitely something that yeah. out there, I, I, that's my next optical up or probably my next upgrade for me is a range finder. Uh, it's not gonna be this year, but that will be my, my next upgrade for me personally. Gotcha. What else, uh, for you, Mike? Oh, I think I'm pretty good on the boots. Um, obviously we're set on the camo. Uh, yeah. Like you said, the only time that I did get cold was sitting for a while and I didn't bring any hot hands if I remember right. And I think if I would have had some hot hands, that would have kind of took the edge off. But I remember that one morning I watched that nice buck um, for quite a while off from a distance. Man, I just got just smoked. I was so frozen solid. I mean, just sitting in one spot for like, I probably sat for two to three hours, I would guess, just right there, not moving, not getting the blood flowing. And it was like once the hands got cold, it was like, man, my feet didn't really get cold, but my hands did. And it was after that, it just seemed like this goes through your whole body. I mean, that who camo, uh, that the heavy outer jacket and the heavy pants did such a phenomenal job of blocking the wind and cutting the wind that it was like I was fine all day there in your core. But once your hands get cold or your feet, it's yeah. like, dude, you're, you can only hold on for so long. Yeah. So I would definitely – I would definitely say I would need to look into some potential warmer gloves and then uh, just remind myself to make sure I have hot hands at all times when you're out there. Um, you know, later in the week, day six, seven, like you didn't need none of that stuff really. I mean, it was, you know, the temperatures had warmed up so much. It was mostly that first three to four days that was like brutally cold. Yeah. I, I was, I, mean, I think with wind chill, wasn't it like, single digits or something a couple of those days with wind chill i think early on it was in the teens if not getting down to maybe eight or nine once or twice you know at some point early but it uh yeah it was it was pretty cool i remember i was actually talking to my dad last night and uh it we were talking about uh just gear and i think he was talking about a recent hunt where you know he got got the blood flowing you know walking or or you know moving around and it's cold outside but he got warm you know started sweating and I'm like well that that was a struggle for me up there because you know it's 20 like the first stalk i had you know i came back on when i try to make a play on that little forky i came back and like inside i'm like pretty warm because i've been walking around the crp even though it's 20 30 you know some odd degrees outside um you know i'm i'm sweating underneath so that was the that was something you know that at least hunting here in texas we don't we don't experience that a whole lot and i'm glad we had the hoot gear that was equipped for the temps a couple weekends later when i was in veteran camp you know we were because of the rain we couldn't drive pickup trucks down to the stand we were hunting so we were driving an atv uh a you know six seater side by side and no windshield so it was cold cold driving driving in and driving out and you know after dark and everything and um everybody's bundling up like michelin men you know to go to go ride and i just i put on the same layers i wore in colorado that's what i did for my hoot gear and everybody's looking at me like are you gonna be warm enough it's like yeah i'll i'll, I'll be fine i'll you know i'll be good and they said well don't you want a warm jacket it's like this is my warm jacket like this is the heavyweight stuff that's the heavyweight like they were they were impressed with how low profile it was for a quote unquote heavyweight coat, I guess, is what they yeah. kept talking about. And then, yeah, driving driving on that side by side, even with the, no windshield and the wind blowing on you, it my hands got cold, and that was it. Just it, the hoot gear withstood that wind phenomenal. So, I mean, talking about hoot gear, I mean, I don't want to get too far off track from this, yeah, you know, this uh, Colorado trip, but just a little shout out about hoot gear. Last night mm-hmm. hunting in Indiana. Uh, season ends uh, January 7th here in Indiana. We're not quite where we want to be with the meat uh, situation going in 
to the off season. And so I went on a, on a hunt last night and had the hoop gear on and I was able to have, I had eight does at less than 50 yards, all eight of them. And I was able to come to full draw and take out a nice doe at 33 yards with no cover, no wind. I mean, dead still no wind last, last night at all. And even with that heavy outer garment on, was still able to come to full draw, settle in, not make enough, not make too much noise. This time of year, they're on edge, man. If anybody's yeah. hunting late season deer, I don't care what state you're in. If they've been pressured for three months, they're on edge. And for me to be able to pull that off with that camo, and it, like you said, it's very tight to your body for an outer late season or just heavy jacket. And dude, I'm yeah, I'm impressed, but I don't want to get too off track. But yeah, no, it uh, it did the job for sure, no doubt about that. Well, what else you guys got? Any uh, Mike, I'll I'll kick it to you first. Any uh, any final remarks about the trip or um lessons learned big conclusions anything like that um as we as we begin to wrap up our story yeah um lessons learned don't question tim (laughs) (laughs) i don't know about that one but yeah okay well you know until until further until proven otherwise don't question tim um be more open-minded when you're going to new territory. Uh, don't be so um, basically close-minded to what you've experienced. Uh, that really was a wedge for me the first few days out there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I learned a lot from this trip. Um, I feel like I've added some good friends and the two of you guys for the first time actually you know, getting to spend a week you know, you spend six, seven days like we did together all day, every day, sun up to sun down, well, past sun down. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 18 hours, 19 hours a day with two other uh, guys that are like minded. And, uh, you know, just what can I say except for wow. Um, extremely blessed to have the opportunity uh, that Tim extended and the Burgess family extended. Um, very honored and humbled to have been given that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> and just, you know, I hope I get a chance to go back sometime. Um, definitely got some revenge on mind. Um, <laughs> and that's not just for deer. That's for those darn pheasants that made me look like <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of my takeaway. Just an absolute awesome, epic seven day trip with you two and i mean it, it, it was i don't know you know it was just awesome i mean I, I i still smile every time i think about that trip and uh just the way it played out and the camaraderie that you guys you know and tim's family oh my gosh his grandparents calling everybody they know as soon as you come back with a, a buck that's been shot with a bow and they're like, you wouldn't believe what happened out here today. <laughs> and you can hear them and you're just laughing so hard inside because they're like, Yo, I know I would have never thought. And he, Tim's grandma saying she would have bet the farm that you would have never gotten <laughs> here with a bow. <laughs> I mean, just great people, great hospitality. Tim's, Tim's grandparents top notch absolute top notch couldn't ask for better people um you know he couldn't ask for better grandparents and we couldn't ask for better camp hosts um than what we than what we received at all i mean mind blown honestly yeah no i i second all that man and and tim for sure man we we can't thank you and your family enough for all that your grandparents enough for all that i've hunted i've hunted before with outfitters where you you didn't get the kind of just warm welcome and hospitality that that we got up there with them and and i i don't know if you'll get that like we had it up there anywhere else man it was second to none in my opinion and like you walk as soon as you walk through the door you feel like part of the family up there and it was awesome so uh yeah can't thank you guys enough for everything you did 
Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I'm definitely uh, very spoiled and lucky to have that oper- you know, that invite basically always. Um, and it, it's just great. So, yeah. What about you, Tim? Uh, you hunt out here every single year. Um, for the most part, sometimes different opportunities or different tags, however it shakes out for you. But, um, what, if anything was different about this year or what did you take away from this year, this buck that you killed, anything like that, that you hadn't before? So I thought the snow was going to be a lot better for us. That was my, when I saw it, I really thought they're going to hunger hard. Um, but then they're going to get up and go to food a lot because they're going to need a lot of food to stay warm. And I figured they're going to sit there in the food all day, which just didn't happen. So they really threw off what I expected uh, for the first couple days and everything. That was like the biggest like learning thing for me. And then um, I, like otherwise, just the weirdness of the whitetails out there. Like they – I think I told you guys a few times, like they, they're definitely migratory. Like, I mean, they, they, there's a river that's like 20 miles away, right by the town where we went and bought Mike's license that they'll go back and forth to in like a two or three day stretch. Sometimes even like almost same day, they'll do that whole, whole journey. Um, and so it, the whitetails are so weird and cyclical and hardly ever like spend a lot of time somewhere there. So it was just weird that we didn't have any, move through in that whole period yeah. or if they did we just never saw them so um and it was also weird to me that 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 buck and his two little buddy bucks stayed in that one field for so long i mean obviously it was like the perfect spot for them um so it's like you guys kept saying like this is the spot this is, you know whatever but it was still super weird for me that they stayed there and once we bumped them i knew like that that thursday I was like, this is Mike's chance because so they're not going to be anywhere close to here tomorrow. Like, I was so not, like, guess not surprised at all that they were nowhere to be found. I wouldn't be shocked if they were went five more miles south overnight and with this into the next county or something. So um, that part really didn't shock me, but, yeah. <laughs> Well, like Mike just said, we've learned not to question you. My my <laughs> Texas brain would be like five miles next county, no way. But I'm inclined to believe you now. <laughs> so no, learned learned a lot for sure, and and uh, it was it was definitely an experience for me just getting to witness witness the same animals that act completely different, and and that was the, a huge educational piece for me. Like Mike said at the beginning, you know, don't don't take a, a local's advice or, you know, input for granted, you know, in an environment like that. But certainly uh, just getting to witness it for myself and, you know, even even through the, you know, some some blown hunts or blown stalks. It's uh, yeah, you learn you learn about deer in a whole new environment. And that's I don't know. You you can't uh, you. you just a part of it you have to experience you can't just read about it or watch a video about it you know being able to learn through experience that that's that's huge and then for me getting to actually have a successful spot and stalk i I know i've mentioned before how that was a dream but uh all of my all of my senses and all like everything that i've i've learned or studied about you know western hunting and stuff i feel like i was able to somewhat apply it in that okay, I gotta, I gotta play the wind or I gotta get low or I gotta do this at this point or, or, or that, or I've, I've heard about guys doing this and I understand now this is why they do that. You know, a bunch of stuff like that kind of came into play throughout those two hours for me. And a bunch of stuff like that was running through my mind and being able to have all that come together for me and, and, and pay off it, it gave me a, a good education of, of Western spot and stock hunting. So well, guys, uh, we can uh, probably head for home to wrap up the podcast at least, unless you guys got anything else you want to add. I think that's about it for me. Yeah, yep, yeah, I'm good. Just like I said, just a big thank you to Tim and the Burgess yes. and, and also for Sam and and everybody just having this platform and, and us being able to, uh, you know, make what I hope to be a lifelong friendship out of, uh, not just through fall obsession, but then through these these hunts and getting getting to meet guys and it just yeah it's 
that's why I wanted to be a, a part of a family like this because it truly is family. Yeah, man. Yeah. Every, everybody I've gotten to meet in person, it, it feels like you've known them forever. And, uh, yeah, I, I'll, we'll, we'll be sharing camp again. The three of us will for sure. So, so yeah, this is number two for me and Sam. So yeah. it's been a while, but it's, it's number two. Yeah. No, there, there will be so, another one for sure. But go on ahead. that note, sorry, I got one thing. Then if we, uh, we are looking for staff out west. Um, yeah, there's basically like two of us. Um, so if you are living in the west and interested, let us know. We are planning a elk and mule deer hunt this fall in Colorado. Um, so if you are on staff by then, we can definitely include you by that. Obviously, it's going to be a draw. So if you need, if you are going to be on staff, you need to put in quick so you can be on by the end of march but definitely look at that opportunity um it's pretty awesome i've been on staff almost six years now and it's been great for the whole time yeah now come come join the team come join the family fallobsession.com is our website and that's where you guys can apply uh for that opportunity and then learn more about what all's involved with that and get in touch with todd or staff manager through that site and everything and he'll He'll help get you squared away and set up wherever you might be. Don't have to be out west to, to join the team, but we certainly, if you are, we'd love to have you. Um, and then I also, before we wrap up, I want to plug our uh, our Flatland Deer Country video because we've now recorded three podcasts about this experience, but this last week we actually dropped uh, the feature film that we put together and, and documented as much as we were able to get um, from this trip. So um, if you guys want to to witness in video form everything that we've been talking about through three podcasts now um go to our youtube channel it should be right there on the front page as soon as you get there flatland deer country uh, a fall obsession film and then if you want to hear about the you know day days one through three and days four through six there's uh two podcast episodes 166 and 167 that you can go listen to 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 get all the details and the full story so encourage you guys to go do that if you haven't already for our listeners thank you all for listening hit up all the socials the youtubes sounds like tim is gonna have to go here pretty soon he's got a uh <laughs> got, got some... kiddos in the bathtub hey that that's that's how we roll over here on fall possession podcast we uh you know kids and and families they they come first so every once in a while you'll hear one peeping into our episodes and that's just how it goes but hit up the socials uh be sure you hit subscribe, whatever platform you guys are listening on. Thanks for tuning in to another Fall Obsession podcast, and we're back again next week for another episode. I'll catch you guys then.